Yo, what's going on, guys? Welcome to the Bottom of the Bill. This week we have Silas Durasher and Jesse Gentry of the Get Right Band. They just released their new album, Itopia, which is an amazing psychedelic indie rock pop kind of uh, collaboration. And uh, I've really enjoyed listening to it. Everything these guys put out is amazing. We've been good friends with them for a long time. We played shows with them back here in Jacksonville uh, a few times, and they just keep getting better and better, and it's amazing to watch them grow. It's a really fun conversation that we had. But before we get to that, we want to talk about the merch store that we have the link in the description to. New merchandise is available. Go check it out. Um, and as always, please like, share, subscribe, anything that you can to help us get the word out. The more you share it, the more eyes get on us, and the more we can grow this thing and bring more light to our scene here in Jacksonville and beyond. So without further ado, here is Jesse and Silas. This is Bottom of the bill. Silas and Jesse, how you guys doing today, man? Doing good. How you yeah. doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. It's uh, I don't know if you guys ever like have this, but like sometimes you get so like overwhelmed with like other stuff that's not music related but also i mean it is music related but not playing related so you don't get a chance to like practice all the time yes but like today i got a chance to practice and that's always like a really fulfilling day when i just, as long as i get that done it's like working out if you get that nice. done you know that you've accomplished something that day you know what i mean totally all right. um so what's been going on with you guys man you guys were telling me that you just got off tour yeah, yeah, we just got back from the like the northeast area, kind of like eastern seaboard, DC, uh, Boston area, New York. Um, so we just kind of got back from that on Sunday. We were gone for about ten days, and previous to that, we've come out with a new album. Yes, Zytopia, it's like our our pride and joy, our, our our baby that has recently come out. Some have called it our Sergeant Peppers. <laughs> Not making that up. That's actual quotations from real fans. Uh, <laughs> So That's super true. proud about that. Um, that's kind of like this year so far what has happened to us as a band. Yeah. I love it, man. Um, how did the tour go? Did you guys, um, like what, what, which van- like what venues were you playing and w- you guys had some solid turnouts? Yeah, it was good. We played Pearl Street Warehouse in D.C. It's a cool spot. Arlene's Grocery in uh, New York, uh, Jamie's House of Music in Philly, um, really cool spot that we love playing called the Fallout Shelter in Boston, outside of Boston. Um, and then we played a festival up in Massachusetts called uh, Strange, Creek. Strange Creek and a handful of smaller spots in between the big cities. And yeah, it was it was fun, man. It was good to be. We had gorgeous weather the entire time and good sound at most shows and good crowds and yeah it was fun that's awesome man i'm curious about how this album came to be because i've i've listened to it a couple of times and it's a really well well thought out record different than the stuff that you've done in the past i feel like yeah for sure we i think all three of us in the band had been kind of getting interested and talking about this subject matter of of how social media and technology are impacting the world and us as as individuals and as a species and as a society and um sometime during the beginning of covid quarantine we we were actually in releasing another record uh the, the previous album itchy soul we released may 2020 and right around that time um I started thinking that, you know, this subject matter, I I had written a couple of songs kind of in this world. And then I kept having more ideas about it. And from conversations with Jesse and JC, it seemed like they were also interested in it. And I started to think, you know, this might be more than a couple songs. This could maybe be turned into an entire concept album, which is something I'd I'd always really wanted to do. I'm I'm very into concept albums um, as a, as a listener, as a fan. So it's just something I always wanted to do. And this seemed like the right time, particularly uh, with COVID, you know, forcing us to be off the road. We had a little extra time on our hands. So we, we got to work starting on, on Itopia. That's a uh, really productive use of that time. There's a lot of bands 
definitely didn't uh, survive that. Um, For sure. It's like one of those things where you either double down and, and focus on what's, what's important, like the writing and practicing and stuff, or you just kind of don't see the point because you're not touring or doing anything. So I'm glad you guys went the other direction with it because this album uh, I've really enjoyed listening to. It's got more like an indie rock kind of vibe, I guess, than, than the other, like the last album, Itchy Soul, that you guys did, I thought had almost like a psychedelic kind of flair to it. And um, this one I feel like is more straight ahead, but has like this very cool, um, I don't know, almost more of a poppy vibe to it. Do you feel that at all? Yeah, it's funny. I feel the opposite ways about the albums. Really? But from just from making them, I guess, and not as as a listener. Um, but I, I could see it your way too. Like with Itchy Soul, we started kind of getting into this kind of our new method of production, which is kind of doing mo most of the work on our own um, and less in like an official studio, kind of doing a lot of it at home and then getting our toes wet, so to speak in that process. Whereas with uh, Itopia, the new album, we've really kind of honed that. So in a, in a sense, we could actually dial it in much more. And I guess like some of the risks we took with itchy soul or whatever, we kind of know how that's going to play out a little bit better the second time around, kind of going through that process again, really just tightening, dialing, and you know, honing things a little bit more. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, what, what's the, uh, do you guys prefer this method of recording kind of more isolated and, and all mostly in-house, or do you miss kind of being in the studio and working collectively in, in, that, in that space? I really prefer it. Were you going to say the same thing, Jesse? <laughs> I, yeah, I am like the most, I don't even like to sleep in a room by myself. I love having other people around me at all times. And I cannot deal with being in the studio with more than just myself or Silas. Yeah. Like I need, I need complete solid, solid, solitude, isolation from the entire world. I don't even need to know if I'm alive. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, yeah, we, I think we work better in that way. And also we've just been a band forever and we've like, we did the thing where we all got together in the studio and played together and did that's that a practice <laughs> method. It works great. Everybody loves it. Um, we've done it. It's, it's sweet, but you really, the, the pressure that is relieved from just doing things alone I, to me is just a, a much higher payoff. You can just really you dial it in. Some people are, are driven more to, to execute more perfectly when other people are holding them to task when it's like, everybody's got to crush it or this take is gone. Um, so, but that pressure can, can also be unhealthy as well, which, you know, it's, it's a two edged sword, a double edged sword, if you will. And, um, this method, at least for me and I believe us really just gets the best out of us. And yeah, then it's, it's, we can come together as a group afterwards and talk about production and mixing and things like that. Right. Yeah, right. It's cool to be able to focus just on one thing at a time, as opposed to being in a studio with three or four people playing live. And you're kind of, you know, as we're performing, we're also like all of our music is co-produced by us. And so, you know, you're also listening and trying to, you know, I'm trying to play guitar, but also listen as a producer is that guitar tone right did everyone nail their parts do we maybe need a different snare on this song you know it's it's cool to be able to focus on one instrument at a time and then uh also obviously being at doing a lot of the recording at home means we're not fighting against the clock very often whereas in the studio obviously you're paying by the hour and there are huge benefits to studios and we did at various points in this um making this album as well as the previous album go into echo mountain studio which is kind of the the premier studio here in Asheville. Yep. and the head engineer there julian uh dreyer is a is a friend of ours and a frequent collaborator so um it's i think it's a really useful space and it's a it's really cool to have a space that's just dedicated to making art and there are times where we wanted to dip into that space, something like recording drums, for example, or times when we wanted to just dip in and get Julian's opinion on things because he has expertise that we do not. And we, you know, we value that. But it, it's cool to be able to come back to our own spaces and have some of that solitary time or that just off the clock time to chase an idea for six hours and see if it's cool. And then at the end of that, be like, ooh, that really wasn't cool. And I'm going to have to just 
throw that out, but no harm, no foul, because we didn't just pay six hundred dollars, you know, in the studio. Right, right. And I'm curious about like the communication method when you're sending tracks back and forth. Is you know, there's got to be an understanding. We talk about it a lot in this show. The idea of kind of setting aside ego for the sake of every for you know, assuming that everyone has the best intention for the music in mind, when you guys are kind of shooting information back and forth and, and ideas, um, how does communication work when, you know, something doesn't work and you spent six hours on something or whatever it might be and someone's like, no, nah, or collectively you guys decide, I don't like this idea or maybe we can try it again this way. Does that, you know, not being in the room together or it maybe even being the pressure of the time crunch, which makes you kind of work faster, does that kind of play in or have like a negative uh, uh, reaction at times? Go ahead, Jesse. I, I think, especially with just a, a trio, there's a lot of like, this is the situation, and I feel a certain way about it, and we, we basically allowed each other to be like, if I feel so strongly about this, that I, I'm going to just be the dictator then that's fine. So it's like, if, if you feel so strongly about something that you need it there, I'm totally happy to be voted outvoted. So like we, we kind of allowed a little bit of leeway to like go between those kind of modes where it's like, yeah, if you work super hard on something and you feel really strongly about it and you need it to be there, I may not agree with it, but because you feel so strongly, I'm willing to give up anything to make that happen. And kind of the same with like, this is really cool. I'd hate to see it go, but if I'm being outvoted, that's fine. And there's also a good amount of just like, everything sounds good. We need to lose something. You know, there's, because I, I feel like there's a lot of stuff like where JC, our drummer, was, he was doing a lot of really cool MIDI drums and drum machine things. And it all sounded dope. But like, we were listening to a song at one point out and we were all just like, there's just way too much happening here. But like we couldn't, it was just so hard to figure out like what to lose. Cause like all of his ideas are really good. It was just like, we got to lose like two or three things at this point in time. So we kind of have to just like, you know, whittle them down be like, how strongly do, do we feel about X, Y, and Z? So. Yeah. And a lot of that communication is happening in the room. Like a lot of times we're, we're working on stuff individually and then we're getting together for sessions of like, like Jesse's saying, like, how much do you care about this? I don't really like this part. How do you guys feel about this part and that kind of thing? And um, another thing we really try to do is listen, uh, you know, don't don't necessarily react immediately, particularly to, to disliking things, right. um, because we've all had the experience numerous times of not liking something on the first listen, being like, OK, maybe it's all right on the second and third listen. And then like by 10th listen, you're like, I fucking love this. So, uh, you know, we, we try to give it those listens. And that's one nice thing about sending files back and forth is being able to sit there by yourself, hear something, and not even really have a chance to share your opinion on it right away. Like, that that can be advantageous to just be like, ah, let me hear that four more times before I even start to try to assess if I like it or if it needs to be tweaked or whatever. Right. Cause yeah, it's like, like a, pop, a pop song will come on the radio and you're like, this is the worst song I've ever heard. How did this make it? To, why is this in my ears right now? And like a week later, it's like, that is my favorite song. Yeah. All right, guys, this episode's brought to you by Best Buds CBD Store. If you're like me, maybe THC isn't always the right high for you. Or maybe the legal status of THC has you a bit hesitant to indulge. So at Best Buds CBD Store, they have an array of CBD and Delta 8 THC products. These guys truly care about their service, so everything is meticulously sourced and prepared to deliver a top-notch product and experience. If you head to their website, you'll find all kinds of educational information regarding Delta THC and CBD, uh, not to mention if you use promo code BOTBPOD, that's B-O-T-B-POD, you'll save 10% on your order. This is not a one-time deal. If you use promo code BOTBPOD, every time you place an order with Best Buds, it will give you 10% off. That's in perpetuity forever. So head over to bestbudscbdstore.com and start saving on all of your CBD and Delta 8 products. Enjoy, guys. Yeah. Because there is something to like listening to, to an idea and it being something that you just would have never thought of and then totally. that that can kind of, I think, have this adverse 
reaction in your head where you're like, I don't like it. I would have never done this. And then sometimes it kind of takes a few times of just really digesting it and understanding what's happening. You're like, oh, I see why this is good now. And just like kind of assuming that you don't or kind of just being okay with the idea that you don't know everything. You don't have all the good ideas and that maybe there's something out there that like you're not familiar with that or a call that's that was made that you wouldn't have made that uh that can work you know yeah totally and i think as the as the kind of primary songwriter the the person who's who's writing the sort of like initial chunk of song that we're then taking and filling out and arranging um for me a lot of times it comes down to like does this work toward you know does it serve the song and a lot, a lot of times that has to do with the lyrics or in in the case of this album the the overall concept of the album so sometimes there were you know i i would hear ideas from jesse and jc that were totally not how i envisioned the song but felt like they strengthened the actual like the main point of the song the 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 purpose or sort of what that song wanted to be or needed to be in the context of the album actually got stronger so it was easy to be like, oh, that's not how I heard it going, but I can see how this this serves the song even better than my original vision. Or sometimes the alternative where it was like, I really like this idea, but I think it's taking us further from what this song is a, is about. Like it sounds cool, but it's not serving sort of the greater, larger picture, you know? Right. And And certainly with my own ideas too. I mean, I had plenty of my own ideas where it was like, that definitely sounds rad, but it's not what this song needs you know yeah for sure for sure that takes like that's cool you guys have that chemistry together where you, and that, that comfort together where you can feel like you can be honest and nobody's gonna like take it to the point of like wanting to quit or feel like their voice isn't heard at a minimum and uh and to, to because a lot of the times that's why these things don't get done like writing a record and putting it out is such a grueling process or it can be especially when you're working with people that don't necessarily think in the way that you do about things because like there's not just the writing and the producing uh part of the of the album then there's like we talk about putting it out um and then there's all the steps that you that, that you take to do that which i've i really like what you guys do with it because your yeah. social for for a concept record that's kind of about the digital age and and the uh the uh, negative effects of social media on on society. Uh, you guys have done a really good job using social media to promote like everything that you do. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious of you know Thanks. what's the creative process there, and uh, you know how how do you think it your image through the marketing kind of lines up with the message that you're putting across musically? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think one thing that comes to mind immediately is that I think we, we, for the most part, genuinely enjoy that side of things. I mean, there is some, there is some element of, um, you know, having to keep up with social media more than, you know, I'm on there more than I wish I was because of the band and stuff like that. But I do see a lot of what we're doing in that realm, whether it's making a poster or a, or writing a newsletter or making a little promo video. I see a lot of that as being just part of the art of being in a band. Exactly. And so, you know, whether we're making some like kind of big creative artistic statement, or it's just Jesse and I dicking around being like silly and doing some dumb little skit, that's fun. You know, that's, that's art. That's making like I, I like making stuff, you know, it doesn't have to be in the form of music. Making stuff is what's fun for me. And I, I like making music, but I like making lots of other things too. Yeah. And that comes across uh, in some of the stuff, the, some of the marketing stuff that you're doing. I love kind of the, uh, the dynamic that you guys create when you're doing like some of the interviews and it's like, you're very pretentious almost. And uh, kind of just like self-congratulatory. Um, is that kind of like, part of the inner workings or like kind of the personal relationships between you guys is that how you guys kind of have fun and, and laugh about things or is that just like an image that you're trying to kind of ridiculously put out i think both i i, I don't know you have an answer to that jesse 
I think it's 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 hard to separate reality from fiction in general. Um, but in in who we are, yeah, I think there's a good amount of just dry humor. Yeah, you know, we we do like to celebrate each other. Like instead of Silas, when I when I sneeze. He doesn't say bless you. He says praise you. <laughs> and so, like, there's just a good amount of, like, just natural, like, building up. But also, we, you know, we'll we'll talk smack about ourselves, too. Like, we'll put ourselves down. It's just we were on the full range of, of human emotions. But we try to just have fun with it wherever we are. Yeah, and there's so time. much there's so much to parody in this world of 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 making music and promoting music and asking people to pay attention to the things we're doing. Um, you know, there's, there's so much to parody. Sometimes I feel like we're really directly parodying ourselves and our, our real personalities or quirks of our personalities. And sometimes it's more of like a broader parody of, of, you know, uh, being an artist or being in this digital world that we're all stuck in <laughs> right right um i'm curious because uh when side hustle was on the on the precipice of releasing our stuff uh silas you and i talked for a while about the marketing stuff and um i was always mm -hmm. again just kind of to, to to circle back to the praise about your marketing stuff um i was wondering about working with uh, with uh marketing companies and pr companies you know your experience with that and you told me that you've done some stuff in the past are you guys working with anybody now uh, or have you with this particular album yeah we've been working with big hassle media um on the publicity end and we've we've worked with a few companies in terms of um digital marketing and spotify and stuff like that i just feel like it, it's incredibly difficult to evaluate um the results, particularly less so with digital marketing, but more so with with publicity. Um, man, I I don't feel like I really have my head wrapped around it very well. I, I feel like there's a lot of disappointment involved. There's a lot of feeling let down, and I don't necessarily put that blame on publicists because. You know, just to take an extreme example, I don't think it's our publicist's fault that they didn't get us on the cover of Rolling Stone or something. Like, we're just not a band at that level. That's, you know, no publicist is going to be able to accomplish that for a band that isn't like taking the stepping, you know, we, there's several stepping stones between here and there. Um, and then, you know, there are other times where it feels like, why isn't more stuff coming through? And then there are other times where it's like, oh, wow, this is incredible. Like, I don't know, even something random, this is years ago, but um, uh, NPR's show World Cafe, you know, reached out to us. And that was kind of shocking. That didn't come through a publicist or through us sending them emails. They reached out to us. So every once in a while, you know, something kind of amazing happens. And maybe that was because of some groundwork that a publicist laid before we laid ourselves. And it's very hard to evaluate what's working and why it's working and what's not working and why it's not working. Yeah, totally. I have no answers. I don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's uh that's We do know that NPR does love to do features on on bands that are three straight white men. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's uh, yeah, we don't make the uh we, we don't we don't have the most interesting uh demographics in our in our band. <laughs> well, you We're guys boring. You guys did do one of those pace sessions, didn't you? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. How were you able to line that yeah, up? Because I remember really cool. seeing that and being like, "What?" Because like, there's some amazing artists that that have done that uh, that series. I know, yeah. You know, that was just me sending them an email with links, and they presumably checked it out and liked it, and wrote. You know, we were we were touring through New York, which is where it's filmed. Um, I guess it's maybe 2019, 18, something like that, and. Um, yeah, they just wrote back and said yes. I mean, you know, usually my answer to, you know, how did you get this particular publicity thing or this particular opening slot or this particular gig or festival, it's usually just like the same way we didn't get 99 other things. Like <laughs> yeah. we tried 100 things and one, and one of them came through. 
there might be a better method. I don't, I just don't know a better method. You know what I mean? And like my only, the only thing I know is, is the, is the hustle and the, uh, throw as much at the wall as possible and see what sticks. Yeah. I think that's kind of the answer, right? Unless you have some kind of representation that's going to be helping you. And obviously even on the PR marketing side, that's much more of a crap shoot than if you have representation on the booking side of it, right? Because at least an agent can almost yeah. certainly line a tour up for you. But uh, a, P- a publicist can't guarantee you an interview or any kind of placement on a show or something, you know? No. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a confusing endeavor. Yeah. Uh, are you guys uh, represented by anybody right now for the live performance side or is it just all self-booking? We're doing doing that independently right now that's awesome. we've uh we've worked with companies along the way but it just has we, we we have yet to find somebody who can do it as good a job as we can do for ourselves i i, I believe those people 100 percent exist but so far we haven't connected with them yeah for sure it's uh it's uh it's difficult like trying to work with people like when you're in like this come up stage I feel like because there's a lot of material that they need to get to get you into the venues that you want to play, and there's this kind of catch twenty two. Like, well, we need you to have X amount of uh, followers in whatever market to get you this and that, but in order to get you this and that, in order to get you those followers, you need to get this and that type thing, you know. So it's like until you're at a certain point, there's almost like really no need to get representation. I feel like you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I hear you. Um, and are you guys like splitting those roles up like, you know, within the band or are you more like, is it, uh, like one person handling most of that and the democratic stuff is more in the creativity? Yeah, I'm, I'm mostly handling that stuff and, and, uh, everyone's got their, their jobs, but I'm, I'm doing most of it and then kind of running things by the team as as needed for you know decision making yeah, like, strategy local musicians will come up to me and be like oh my god how did you get this i saw you doing that oh my god this is awesome how is this happening and i was like silas de Rocher yeah <laughs> is, is my answer i was like you you need to get silas or somebody like him if you want this stuff to happen yes yeah, somebody that's like that. constantly knows of the grindstone and just like pounding it out it's like wild to have that kind of drive to make that stuff happen and then also the creativity like like consistently write and put stuff out um are you currently writing right now for, for the next record we're not really i'm i'm always writing but I, I wouldn't say we're thinking too much about the next album at the moment i think uh this album <sighs> So uh, uh, this is our sixth album, and every album has taken longer than the one before it. And this album in particular, it it took a very long time, and partially it was because of the scale. Like, it's an hour long, it's 17 tracks, it's a concept album, everything ties together. There's musical and lyrical themes that weave throughout. We were holding ourselves to an extremely high standard in terms of recording quality and production, and it just took an insanely long time and was an insane amount of work. And I think we all have been on the same page that we wanted to get it out and like ease back for a second and just, you know, kind of let it be out in the world. We got to of course still be focused on, on publicizing it and playing shows to support it. Um, but I, I don't feel creatively compelled to um, start like immediately working on the next one. Yeah, that makes sense. The whole process is so arduous. They like sometimes taking a step back for a while. Intense. Yeah, it's like that that, that reset, right? Because like sometimes you don't have the juice left in you after everything to even like pick up your instrument or do anything. <laughs> so it's like that that yeah. that that reset can kind of help spark that creativity. To sometimes I feel like getting to a point like like where where you take so much time to kind of recalibrate that you get to a point where you start to get anxious because you realize oh i haven't done anything in x amount of time i need to start thinking about something to do and then out of that kind of anxiety the next endeavor will just kind of manifest itself do you find that at all you know 
I I think we have been really driven to add new material, whether it's it historically like prior to this album, we haven't written an album and then started playing it. We've kind of write a song, start playing it, write a song, start playing it, write a song, start playing it. Eventually we're like, Hey, that's, you know, 12 or 14 or 15 songs. Let's record that. And so throughout our existence as a band, I feel like we've been pretty continuously adding new material just, just for mostly for ourselves because it's, it, it can get a little boring to play the same songs over and over again. Just having one new song in the set really um, spices things up for, for us. So we, we, we've been pretty diligent about adding material, but um, I think too, because on this album, we mostly weren't playing it live until the record came out. We now suddenly have this influx of, you know, 10 songs that we hadn't been, that hadn't been in our live shows. So it's, it's, it's all still kind of like feels fresh and exciting and still feel like we're kind of figuring out how those songs live live and, um, you know, trying to figure out how to nail them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Usually by the time the album comes out, we're like, we're, we're over those songs. Like we've been playing these songs. They're, they're great. We've had a good time with them. They're on an album now. Let's move on. Or as like Sasha said, like we, we haven't done that this time. So like the album comes out now, it's like, Oh, now we get to play these songs. Right. Right. That's an interesting, I guess, guess new kind of, thing with with uh covid being what it was with the lockdowns where it was like you could write a record and not have like that kind of audience interaction or just like the 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 getting tired of playing the songs like that dynamic isn't there you spent most of the time writing and recording it without performing it and then it's like now you get to actually see the fruits of your labor you get to go out there and see the reaction of people um do you do you feel like what what do you think i'm curious about the different perspectives there like having played songs um and i'm sure as you go when you're performing them live you start to kind of make adjustments to them right like maybe this part doesn't work maybe this part works or this part needs to be longer here whatever maybe we need to add a section doesn't feel complete um i know i've experienced that with performing songs live versus writing them isolated with this album kind of working the other way do you feel uh what's that i'm curious just about that perspective uh and what it feels like playing them live now versus the other way well i feel like now with our set lists it's like with the influx of the newer material there's so many songs that we just don't play anymore like we we have like not that we don't love those songs but we try to keep our set list much tighter now mostly the new material and then i kind of envision the the other songs that we play, like the songs we have been playing that we're still playing, it's kind of just like our best songs. And so for me, at least, because they've made the cut, they're like, our, you know, it's like your favorite children or whatever. Like you, you're always going to love your children. But like, it's like, oh, these are still around. We're still crushing these songs. Like sometimes you have to make adjustments here and there. But I kind of just look at it as like, oh, these are like the best of the best. Like, these songs are still crushing. They've still made the cut, so you got to do them justice. Right, right. And you don't find yourself like kind of like retweaking stuff on this new album, like and now that it's already out, but just on the live side, like it's got to be a bit of a different experience um, performing, like for for like performing them live versus what they were in the studio. Are you guys not making adjustments as you go, given you know the fact that you haven't, you didn't really get a chance to test them out on a crowd before you record the record. Yeah. I mean, we, we had a pretty big rehearsal period getting ready for the album release. And a lot of the songs did require fairly significant tweaking to go from the studio version to the live version, largely because of just what's physically capable, because it's a very, um, lush kind of thickly layered, um, record and live we are often a trio and at most we're a quartet so yeah we had to kind of refigure out some of the songs some of them kind of lent themselves more more um directly from studio to live but yeah a lot of these songs have been 
um, you know, somewhat significantly tweaked to, to make the live version work, which was, which was hard. It was a long, it was a long, hard process, but it was also like a good, it was a fun challenge. And I, f- I feel like, especially having just done, you know, 10 nights on the road or something where we're playing a lot of the new material and now it's, it's really feeling like it's, uh, it's, it's kind of found its groove, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, uh, what's the, uh, what, are you guys like planning on touring more or are you got, taking a break for a while? We got a lot of, um, like Southeast stuff over the next several months. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't think we have any immediate plans to do, you know, big long tours, but, uh, you know, we're, we're bouncing around the Southeast all through the rest of the year and playing shows around, um, you know, our region. Yeah. Are you guys mostly like mixing it up, like doing venues and bars or are you guys kind of trying to get out of like the bar and restaurant thing? Yeah, we don't do a lot of the bar restaurant thing anymore, unless it's kind of a uniquely well set up spot. Um, so yeah, doing a lot of venues and some like festivals and, you know, city concert series and things like that through, through the warm weather. Hell yeah. All right. Well, um, I want to, we, I told you guys about this segment that we do on the podcast. It's called the uh, unpopular opinions. I don't know if you guys got any locked and loaded, but we typically start off with Chris, who's been uh, silent today for the most part. Chris, what you got, bro? All right. Um, I think the Rolling Stones are criminally overrated if you compare them to the Beatles and other stuff coming out of the out of that region. Uh, out of all of them, I would put the Stones pretty low on my list. Really? I would. Chris, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. that's a somewhat popular opinion. You think? Cause I, I mean, the Rolling Stones are huge. Yeah, they're pretty popular. When I feel like I hear Rolling Stones and the Beatles in the same breath a lot of the time. And like they're like, oh, everything coming out of that era. And it's like the Beatles were so much further ahead creatively, sonically. And the Stones were like the ugly stepchild that always wanted a ride to the to the mall or something they're like let me in the car and they would always get in but like not deserving of that shotgun seat you know i, mean, I think that's i yeah i think that's cool it's it's i mean i i more or less agree like the stones are one of those bands that if i really stop and listen i can find things to appreciate and i can understand why people connect with them totally and i've never seen them live and i'm and i understand that you know they put on a a hell of a show so i I would enjoy seeing them live um maybe like in their hundreds but um (laughs) when you know when i mostly when i listen to i i don't connect very much so i i I, your unpopular opinion is popular with me hell yeah and (laughs) i mean like they started off like both the Beatles and the Stones started off doing like a lot of cover stuff, and I feel like the Stones never got past that phase. Like they were so influenced by right, like, American really blues sound. rock, yeah. Like, and they kind of stuck in that sound where the Beatles started with that and like grew to develop the, this whole other texture, and like the Stones kind of just stayed right where they were, you know. And that's good on them. They found a formula that worked and everything, but. I don't know. That's just a little too much hype for me. And I did get, I was lucky enough to see him live and it was an unreal production, fireworks and everything. But if you need fireworks to cover up your musicality, then that's kind of a problem. So (laughs) whatever. Like literal fireworks? Literal fireworks. Wow. Yeah. It was a stadium show, fireworks and everything. It was, it was crazy. Nice. Um, Well, I got to say that um, just playing devil's advocate here. Um, those kids play that, some sympathy for the devil for me. <laughs> I, I, I was gonna get there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think that taking into account the timing when it was all taking place, you had you know very little bands. I think that were pulling from the more uh, blue collar blues and country thing and bringing it to the mainstream. And I think the Rolling Stones. We're kind of doing a unique take on a lot of the stuff at that time. Uh, not saying that if they were to come out and do their thing now, there would be anything groundbreaking. Obviously, they could be like if they were to come back now and do what they were doing. 
I would say, you know, you could catch him at a, at a local bar on the weekends and that would be fine. But um, given the time, I think that they were a little bit more um, ahead of it than we're giving him credit for. There's a difference between, I, well, between being, you know, important and being overhyped. Like, yeah, that's an important thing to do. But like, you right. know, there was a lot of musicians that did a lot of groundbreaking work that do not get talked about like that. So what were you going to say, Silas? Yeah, yeah I. I also think, you know, like Chris said, you, you do hear that, that Rolling Stones, Beatles debate, um, or you hear people say, like, I'm more of a Stones person or I'm more of a Beatles person, which, you know, in the end, it's it's all just kind of silly and for fun. But I, I do think using the, the thought experiment that you just used, Anton, that if if you brought the Beatles back, particularly, you know, later, last five, six albums, Beatles, um presently it would actually still be like fairly groundbreaking i mean obviously so many bands have been influenced by them that it's not going to come out sounding you know maybe insanely different than like dr dog or something but uh i i do think their music would still be like pretty groundbreaking now 50 years or whatever it's been later which which is cool to think about that uh you know that it that it was that much of their own sound that even with all the the imitation of it kind of nobody's really come close that's very true actually and something that i didn't really think about because if you do compare the later years of the beatles to where the stones were at that time and you were to take them both and recreate them now i think the beatles stuff would still definitely hold up particularly like you know revolver uh even rubber rubber soul and on you know like a lot of the uh yeah. Uh, you know, Sgt. Pepper's Abbey Road, Magical Mystery Tour, a lot of that stuff was so production wise, like advanced, and the ideas and the use of like the orchestra and all the different textures that they were coming up with, I think is such a. Um, I think that today would still be an interesting take on, on, uh, you know, it'd be an interesting competitor in, in the market today, I, I would say, in the pop world for sure. Totally. Yeah, and this is not my unpopular opinion, but while we're talking about the Beatles, I'll throw out another possibly unpopular opinion, which is that they were completely out of control with their panning. Like, it, <laughs> it, it, it's atrocious. It's, totally. I mean, I, I, I love the Beatles. I could not love them more. But if you put that on with modern ears and listen to it in headphones, it's, it's out of control. Like, yeah. that shit needs to be camp down by like 80 <laughs> percent yeah totally another thing that i would equate to the time and and experimenting with the possibilities totally. yes if you, if you watch like uh old movies it's a, a similar thing um and what i'm talking i don't like not super old but like you know 60s and 70s and you watch some of the use of the transitions or like some of the editing choices you're like oh yeah. this is so bad but it's also an acknowledgement of like yeah. trying out the new technology of the time and seeing what works and what doesn't so totally. it's like on a lot of that stuff you have to you know what i do is just try and like look at the substance of the thing and what the intention was and say oh that's cool even though it maybe didn't the execution might have been a little off uh because there wasn't any standard to live up to uh it's still like the, the fact right. that they tried you know yeah what uh what what unpopular opinions do you guys have to bring to us today? Jesse, do you have one for us? Well, is it does it have to be music related? No, it can be about it literally like life in general. Anything you want. I have one of each. Okay, let's hear them. Let's hear them. And Casada said that you wanted something that would spark some debate or whatnot. I love debate. And my unpopular opinion is that global warming, which is a totally real thing. Is actually a good thing. Uh oh, here we go. Mm, which is the obje- it's just like that's obviously an unpopular opinion. Yeah, and tell us why. The reason is, first of all, if global warming does in fact lead to our extinction, that'd be great for the planet because <laughs> we are terrible. Um, and if it doesn't, it could potentially. I think it, it needs needs to be a humbling experience for us as human beings to learn that we have horribly mishandled ourselves on this planet and we do need to be punished for that um and if we don't get super punished for it or if we get punished enough but we don't go extinct 
then it will lead to some fantastic innovation as far as technology so that we can come out smarter and better prepared for the future on the other side. Yeah, well, that's definitely a silver lining. I can get behind that. Yeah. Um, so I, that's my popular opinion about global warming. Yeah. It does feel like we have to have things that are so extreme for, for humans on any kind of large scale to make any kind of change. The repercussions have to be so extreme. It makes me think of, I think David Cross had a joke in one of his stand-up specials. I, I forget the specifics, but the gist of it was like, how many people need to be killed in a mass shooting for us to do something different about guns? And he was, you know, like, oh, I calculated a number. It's it's twelve thousand. It's twelve hundred thirty-two people have to die in a mass shooting. But the problem is, it has to be cumulative. I, I mean, it can't be cumulative. It has to all be in like one, you know. And it, it does kind of feel like that. Like if if truly life shattering world shattering things don't happen we'll just keep on trucking with the status quo right and i think that there's also an important thing to note with that is that the earth will be okay regardless of what we do really the the uh the thing at risk is our species so it's like (laughs) you know like the idea of global warming and whatever contribution we're making to it is like okay it might not ruin the earth totally but because the earth is going to adjust and then we're going to be destroyed however we're destroyed and there there is an argument even in the um like a real argument in the political sphere about how we handle it and there are you know some newer schools of thought about you know making building technology to help us adapt to the inevitable or do we continue to try and push you know more regulation and trying to prevent it. And a lot of the argument is, well, we're not going to prevent it now. It's right. happening. So what do we, what do we call like, What do we create or invent now to adapt and keep us from totally, you know, being obliterated by the conditions that we create, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm looking forward to those innovations in technology that come about because like you said, we're, we're past the, the point of no return. So yeah, there's exactly. no, there's no reversing it at this point. So We'll get some sweet new technology at some point. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Jesse, what's your other one? Oh, my musical related one is that. So as I've gotten older, I've gotten a lot more into pop music, which when I was a kid, I hated pop music. Now I love it. And even like horrible sugar pop, I think is is a good thing for 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 music I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm glad it exists I, I when I was younger I was of the opinion that it was horrible and that people that listened to it were simpler at least in their tastes of music not in their thinking that they're simpler tastes um, but now I have come to realize that it's not only enjoyable to listen to but it's also good for the ecosystem of music because there's just something about the universality of music that's enjoyable to listen to on a very surface level that appeals to just the, you know, it just feels good, you know? And I think even though the songwriting is trite or been done a million times before, and it's repurposing the same three chords and melodies and harmonies, every single song, it still feels good. And I support it. Nice. And that's why I'm popular right. opinion about popular music. <laughs> I actually agree I like with it. that. Um, do you have examples of bands that uh that, that you could or like artists that you would say fall into that category of, you know, maybe not being like a lot of depth, but there's a lot of, you know, uh volume in their in their customer base, I guess, the listeners. Um not really. I mean, when I was growing up, it was like a lot of like boy bands, which I know there's there's still boy bands around, but I'm kind of thinking like these like there's a lot of I don't even know all their all their names, but a lot of like these female like these like singer songwriter females where are these pop stars and these like boy bands that are still around that like you know in our day it was like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC or whatever. Um, nowadays we got like the Jonas Brothers, like One Direction, these kind of things and. I, yeah, you just, 
just got to just got to grow to accept that they are great and that you should love them. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's like a uh, there, it's also like a lot of the producers that they work with are pretty knowledgeable and extraordinarily talented totally. and have done a lot of the work on there. And like Jeff Basker is uh, somebody who produces a lot, a lot of pop artists, and he produced a couple of the tracks on Dua Lipa's last album. And he's like a Berkeley trained musician. He was roommates with like Eric Krasno from uh, you know who played the Lettuce and all that. He was roommates with him in Berkeley and. Like his, and if you listen to the, to the the track in particular that he produced, there's little thi- little nuggets in there for like musicians and real like real appreciators of music to catch on to, like little like hip progressions that are kind of buried. Where you're like, oh, yeah. after the second or third listen, you catch it. And a lot of the the pop music that's being produced now, I feel like has this element of jazz and even gospel. Uh, that gets thrown into it, particularly the live performance side, that I think makes the music a lot more enjoyable across the board because they figure out a way to make it palatable, but then also hide these cool little things for people that really think about music on a deeper level, you know? Yeah, totally. Silas, what uh, what, what you got for Unpopular Opinions, bro? My Unpopular Opinion is that Roger Waters is one of the greatest singers in rock history okay and i just say unpopular because i don't think he would make any list or has ever made any list of great singers and i and i think there's even somebody in his band that is in many ways a much better singer than him but he kind of embodies the attitude and spirit and drama and theatrics of what to me is the most likable thing about a singer that I I connect with. And I think like we, we kind of, I mean, this, this might just be me trying to give myself hope, but I think we, in our thinking about singers, we over prioritize uh, technical skill and talent more than our ears and hearts actually react to those things. If, if that makes sense, if that's not too esoteric. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. And I think I would put, cause I'm a huge Steely Dan fan. So I would kind of put Roger Waters in a similar vein as like Donald Fagan, where like, no, his, his voice is not the greatest voice of all time. But he's a fantastic singer because he's, you know, he just he's serving the song and the quirkiness is, is a part of it. And it's, I mean, similar to like Bob Dylan, although Bob Dylan is pretty rough, uh, <laughs> but like he's got all the emotion and, you know, he's he's hitting on those, all those other things in a similar vein. So, yeah, I, I I could see it. It may not like you said, maybe not that his voice may not be the, the most like technically brilliant voice as far as technical ability but with- no i mean he's downright pitchy like uh, <laughs> fairly regularly but i just don't even feel like it matters i mean you know beatles is another good example like john I, I feel like you know by any kind of technical evaluation paul is a better singer than john oh yeah but i love both their singing i mean john sounds you know fantastic even when he's not nailing it from any kind of technical aspect because it's just bringing so much personality and, and uh, attitude to it. And I, I feel like rarely, like if somebody asked me, you know, to list my top 50 favorite singers of all time, not, I doubt one of them is going to be someone like, um, I don't know, Mariah Carey or something who is like technically just insanely skilled, but like that just doesn't particularly move me, you know? Yeah, there's like a characteristic that a lot of these people have, like the people that you're mentioning, like John Lennon, Bob Dylan, obviously, in his own way, Roger Waters, even David Gilmore, too. You know, he's got a uniqueness, a character to, to his voice that uh, that may not come through as technically the best. Like, they're not going to, you stack them up against in the rock realm, like Freddie Mercury or, you know, Roger Daltrey. Like, they're, they're not going to hold yeah. up technically. No. But there's a uniqueness to what they do, and that to me is like the artistry, you know, like 
like I would tend to agree with you, but I would probably reframe it as more of like an artistry argument because like we had this conversation the other day when we were talking about one of Chris's unpopular opinions was like, I think Dua Leap was a better artist than a pop artist than Taylor Swift. And though, you know, musically we can make an argument for her music having, you know, more depth in the production side and there's just more happening musically, you know, to remove the music from it and just look at the overall artistry of the thing, it's hard to put anyone ahead of Taylor Swift as far as modern pop artists go because, like, there's just a full encompassing of the of the enterprise that she nails on every front. Like, you just can't compete with that. And I would say that a similar thing on the side of, like, you know, some of the, some of the, the less technical rock singers where there's a full scope of what we're looking at here. It's not just the technical ability, it's what's coming through in their voice, the character, and what, you know, the performance side, like what, what are they portraying? It, it's it's theatrical, there's so much more to it than just hitting the right notes, you know? Yeah, yeah, I love that theatrical element. Like I've always thought, I, I, I've always uh, thought of Roger Waters more as like, like more akin to, um, like a Disney villain than to Rod, you know, uh, Freddie Mercury or something like exactly. the, the way he pull, pulls off that, those theatrics and that personality to me is, is just so cool. I just love it. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with you. I love that. That's a great opinion for sure. Um, let me pull up mine here. I'm going to, um, probably pull, I've got like a list here. That How I- many episodes of this podcast have you guys done? 109. <laughs> this is 109? Yeah, no, this so will you, be 100 so you, you, something. Yeah. You've had to each come up with 109 unpopular things. Yeah, bro, it's 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 That's a lot. it's daunting especially now that we're doing like three podcasts a week. So we have to like <laughs> I have like I have like a list of shit that I keep here. And sometimes, you know, like I'll go back to I'll, I'll reference one from an old episode, which is which is what I'm going to do today. It's hard to come up with new ones okay. all the time. But um I'm going to say that uh, okay, kind of kind of tagging on to, to the global warming thing. Uh, this is seems to be a pretty unpopular opinion uh, amongst a lot of people, but I think that the world is overpopulated. I have a feeling like we're not going to get anybody here who disagrees with me on that, but I think that the general consensus amongst people is that we have much more room to procreate and there's enough resources to, to take care of everybody. And that's not the point that I'm really trying to drive home when I'm saying that the world is overpopulated. But I do believe that we are overpopulated for sure. Wait, so what are you saying? We aren't overpopulated? No, we are overpopulated. I was just making the the argument that the general consensus would say that we aren't. There's plenty of resources in space for people to continue to procreate. And that's not the point that I would... That's not the case that I would make. You know, I think that... We are overpopulated for different reasons. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're overpopulated. I think our population just grew exponentially too fast. That's what it is. Yeah, for the existing system. So we've had to resort to things, namely factory farming, in order to sustain the caloric needs of the population, which has decimated the planet. So if we had reached the same population, but over a longer period of time, we could have hopefully come up with more sustainable methods of feeding the population that's what ends up happening i feel like when we like when we talk about resources and space it's like well human needs grow exponentially and not to mention that when people are confined in in the bigger cities there's this idea of scarcity there's there's this illusion of scarcity so people tend to just naturally consume more and hoard which becomes a big problem and it and it kind of you know, perpetuates the the factory farming, the mass production of goods, which, you know, ultimately the quality control goes out the window. And wh- whatever we're consuming across the board, whether it be food, art or anything, it's it's not there's no substance in it. So we end up creating a very unhealthy population across the board, mentally, physically, otherwise. And that's why we end up in a culture like we are today, which is not sustainable. You know, if we continue to grow this version of humanity exponentially, it, there's no way it's sustainable, in my in my opinion. Yeah. So you're saying everybody needs to start practicing abstinence. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe we incentivize like uh, 
what do you call it uh when you get snipped <laughs> Uh, uh, vasectomy. vasectomy. We incentivize vasectomies, or uh, absolutely, you know what I mean. Like, hey, if yeah, you get I, your, I just, start just giving tax break. Like, you get a like, <laughs> yeah. tax break if you're if you're cut. Yeah, yeah and the problem is solved. Exactly. Yeah. I would one hundred as a musician, one hundred and twenty percent do that if I got a tax break. <laughs> to yeah. snip my shit, bro. Are you serious? Do it for free. I do. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you just made it, if you just made the operation free, I'm I'm game. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> what do you think, Chris? Are we overpopulated? Uh, totally. Yeah, I mean, there's a hundred percent. There's just way too many of us running around. In fact, if we could start with the musicians and just kind of <laughs> trim that herd down, so just <laughs> get a little more uh, gig opportunities here and there. Um, and then the rest of them will get we'll get those guys figured out. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. Chris, are you a musician? I am. Yeah. Okay. I just happen to be right. good at a lot of things. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> oh, thanks. Well, music's not one of them, but I appreciate that. Okay. He tries. Yeah, Anton hard. told me that before you got on. Yeah, he usually goes around saying that, and <laughs> no, it's all good. Chris is a great guitar player, songwriter, producer. He's got a couple cool projects. Alchematic, Time Wise. Everyone should go check them out. All, all, all in the precipice of releasing music. Oh. Uh, Thanks. So, nice. uh, highly recommend that. And guys, uh, where can people find all your stuff? Social media, all that stuff. We, the name of our band is the Get Right Band, and if you type that into any search field, you will find us. But you know, we're at the Get Right Band everywhere, and the Get Right Band um, and just the Get Right Band. You'll find Spotify. us. Hell yeah! Spotify. Yes, we're we're everywhere. Spotify, YouTube, Instagram. What have you? Other MySpace. things. MySpace. Yeah, unfortunately, we're not on MySpace. <laughs> That's oh. the one place we aren't. We need to get on there, probably. Yeah. Does it still exist? It does exist. I, I logged into my old account a few, like a, maybe a year or two ago, just to see if it still was happening. Believe it or not, there's some nice. pictures that I definitely don't want up still up there. <laughs> so, nice. Um, guys, thank you so much for being with us today. This is a great conversation. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. appreciate you having us. Hell yeah. We'll talk to you guys soon. Good luck out there. All right. Thanks, Anton. Yep. Peace.